Uh, yes. So uh, really the purpose of this call, we've kind of distilled it down to the idea of this call is, um, is to help you understand whether or not a heat pump is right for you at this point in time. Um, it's likely that you've been getting a lot of messaging one way or the other on that, like some people saying you absolutely should and some people saying you absolutely shouldn't. So, so hopefully this will help you to, to understand that better. Um, so yeah, as Jackie said, I, I've been working in, in as a retrofit assessor, sort of bespoke retrofit assessor in, uh, in for over a decade, worked closely with the people powered retrofit in Manchester where I used to live also an air tightness tester. Why well, I'm not, to be absolutely clear, as a heat pump engineer, but I have spent quite a lot of time working uh, in building services and specifically in the building services related to, to retrofit. So that's, you know, how, how heat is delivered uh, in retrofitted homes. Um, I gather that there have been other calls like this about what, what what actually a heat pump is and I think Jackie's got a nice little video somewhere that shows it so we're not going to take up any time here um, going through what what a heat pump actually is and assume that people have got a degree of knowledge on that. Yeah I'll just jump in there Gervais to say um, at the start of the chat sequence there's a link to a really nice um, very very clear explanation of how they work and we have got recordings to our past events thanks Gervais. thanks jackie so yeah so in in retrofit uh, for the for the last 10 years or so um we've always hammered this um we've hammered a, a few little phrases but one of the one of the big ones has always been fabric first uh fabric first fabric first fabric first that we should always be trying to insulate and ma making airtight our dwellings before we think about any kind of technology to go on to it um and in the last I suppose 12 months within the sort of in the retrofit industry um that narrative has started to change and we've been doing a lot of navel gazing and and um and thinking about uh why that narrative might change and the, the reasons are primarily it's been primarily um triggered by the fact that the grid has decarbonized in the last five years radically and if you can see if you can make out this graph on the right hand side these are lots of scenarios that have been put forward for grid intensity carbon intensity it's 2010 on the bottom left there and 2070 on the right and this gray line with the dots on it is actually what's been measured over the last year so this final dot here with the circle around it is 2021 ish i would say and you can see that it's very very close to the blue line which is the carbon intensity of fossil fuel gas. Um, and because of that, it, it's quite clear that very soon those two things are gonna reach parity. Um, and with the performance factors, so that, that SPF there stands for seasonal performance factor, with a performance factor of a heat pump um, being better than 100% efficiency, you might say, versus a boiler, which is at best probably 95% efficient. And in most cases, a heat pump, you know, could be 200, 300, even four and 500 percent efficient. In some cases, it's been found. That means that the, the carbon intensity of the energy that is delivered for heat is much, much, much lower than it would be with gas. And because of that, we decided to, to change our thinking a little bit. Coupled with that, it's clear that deep fabric um, retrofit, which I've done a couple of myself, um, comes with some some challenges, not least of being which it's very, very expensive to do. It's disruptive uh, and, and difficult. Uh, it takes quite a long time and involves quite a lot of manpower. And there is in itself a carbon cost to doing it that's associated with materials used, um, which it at a mass scale tend to be petrochemical derived materials those kind of insulations rather than the more um benign materials uh, natural fiber materials which can be used but even those have a have a carbon cost to them so those two sort of things coupled together made us realize that that actually where appropriate getting onto a heat pump is the single 
cheapest, both in terms of money and in terms of carbon measure that we can do right now. So um, yeah, there's been, as I say, there's been quite a lot of thinking about that. Yeah, but just to say, you know, we need to really think about not only decarbonizing the grid, but um, decarbonizing the manufacturing um, as well, both in terms of the materials used and the energy that's used for that around the world, not just in the UK, because we don't derive all our materials from here. The other reason why it's a good idea to get a heat pump now is because the government is offering £5,000 for you to change out either your fossil fuel boiler or your direct electric or storage heater system under certain conditions. But it is a limited part. I think they've got 450 million. So, um, yeah, it is running. We will run out and we don't know where it'll go next. Just wanted to talk quickly about what affects the performance of a heat pump. Again, you probably have been over this. Um, the biggest thing that we're worried about is them cycling, which means turning off and on a lot, which isn't so much of a problem with a, with a gas boiler, but with a heat pump will tend to affect that seasonal performance factor. The seasonal performance factor is the efficiency. So a seasonal performance factor of three means that for every one unit of electricity you put in, you get three units of heat out. And yeah, we really want to be trying to get heat pumps to work at three or above. <coughs> So yeah, having too big a heat pump or not having enough heating for the heat pump to be working on uh, are some of the things that will affect uh, its cycling and therefore being inefficient. And as a result of this, we are going to move to a new pattern of heating uh, culture in this country. Traditionally, most of us heat by turning the radiators on very hot. So the, 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 the temperature of the radiators is very hot just for two or three hours in the morning and again sometime in the evening. That's that's kind of intermittent, what we call an intermittent heating pattern, and that is the culture that we're kind of existing. And when we move over to a heat pump strategy, we're gonna go for what I've heard described as low and slow, where the, the radiators are could be described as warm rather than hot, but they're on for a lot more of the time. There aren't any zones, so you don't turn rooms totally off that you're not in, you just heat them to a slightly lower temperature. We don't have big buffers, which we don't in our homes currently have, but on other um, in other heating strategies, they are used. But this will mean that we need tend to need to have more radiator output. Um, and that's because as the flow temperature to the radiators drops, their, their, their capacity to put them uh, heat out is uh, also reduced. And that's, that's what that graph on the right hand side shows there. So. The typical temperatures we have at the moment, 75 degrees right on the left there, um, a typical two panel radiator will put out about a kilowatt of heat, but down at 45 degrees where we're sort of suggesting it is a, is a good a value for getting efficiency, uh, that's about a third as much, it's about 300, a little bit over 300 watts. So um, yeah, it, it's possible that in some homes radiators need to be larger. The other thing that for all of those of us on combi boilers, we're going to need to put a cylinder in to go with our heat pump. Although that doesn't in itself affect the performance. For some reason my screen's not working anymore. I do apologise, no, it seems to be. It's looking good. Is it um, shifting to the next? Uh, slide that's troublesome. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay. Um, if it doesn't work, I suggest yeah stopping sharing, then coming back in. Thanks, Javes. It's frustrating. Work. Uh, Jav, actually, what it might be is, do you have any notices about people waiting in the waiting room? No. No. Okay. Ah, you've moved on. It's good. Sorry, so I'm going to have to find myself. Do apologise for this. Why heat pumps? What affects before? Right, okay, so now to get into the number of it. Will the heat pump work in my house? Theoretically, yes. You could put a very large heat pump onto any house and, um, uh, and you have enough heat to put it out. And most people could do that right now. I've got examples just recently. I was doing assessments, I've done five assessments in the last couple of months at houses in and around the Greater Manchester area. Five quite different homes, two, two semi-detaches with cavities, one semi-detached with solid walls, one 
solid walled mid terrace house and one cavity wall detached bungalow and all five of them were under the impression that they wouldn't be able to have a heat pump easily that they'd need to do deep fabric measures in order to have one and actually when i looked at it for four of them it was absolutely the right thing for them to be doing the minimum they needed to get them on a heat pump right now and only in the case of the solid walled cab uh, solid walled semi semi detached house was it um, a little bit more questionable and the reason for that is <clears throat> when looking at the energy loss of the house the size of the heat pump meant that if plans were to do further work later to improve the like the performance of the walls for example um that the heat pump would then be much too big and and, and equally and interestingly actually something i meant to mention before so the, the lady in this particular house was she was french actually she said uh, they were they had energy efficiency hammered into them in the in the 1970s um during the oil crisis and so she runs her boiler at 45 degrees which is extraordinarily low um but what she didn't realize was that meant that she wasn't able to actually heat her house as warm as she wanted it to be um so she didn't have enough radiator output at the flow temperatures and you so you can start to start pretending you've got a heat pump with your existing boiler by turning the flow temperatures down um you do need to have enough radiator so you should only do it incrementally a little bit at a time and what you'll find is that the boiler then starts to act a bit more efficiently and you can start to lengthen the amount of time that you're heating for you get a more comfortable experience rather than this kind of peaking and troughing of heating up and cooling down and heating up and cooling down it's a more even temperature <clears throat> so yeah what really governs whether or not we think it's a good idea for you to have a heat pump right now is whether or not that heat pump is going to be quite large and that you need to kind of put a lot more radiators in in order to make it work effectively and efficiently so how do you find out whether you need to do anything to your house right now well you could approach an installer they will re be required they have to be mcs certified micro generation certificate certified to be able to install under the bus scheme um, and they will have to do a heat loss calculation in order to work out what size heat pump you need and, and how much radiator output you need. Or you could get somebody like me to do um, a retrofit style assessment to do an energy model of your house and, and, um, and find out how big a heat pump you need and, and how much radiators you need. If you don't do anything to your house, but something is required, so if the recommendation came back and by the recommend, by the way, the recommendation, not even recommendation, the requirement for the BOS scheme is that you have an EPC that is less than 10 years old and that there are no outstanding recommendations for loft or cavity wall insulation. Um, so, yeah, you have to have done, you have to have you had your fill, cavities filled and you have to have uh, had your loft topped up before you can be eligible for the BOS scheme. Um, and if you don't do these things, then although there will still be a carbon reduction because of what we saw about the, the grid intensity of the carbon intensity of the grid, the, due to the cost of electricity versus the cost of gas, you will find that it costs more money to heat your house now than it did prior to having a heat pump. Additionally, if we start putting in lots of large heat pumps all across the country, we have 22 million homes in this country. If we, if we, convert everything to heat pump and all of those are very large then a, a grid that wasn't really designed for delivering heat was only really designed for delivering appliances will be under strain particularly in rural areas as we are a lot of us are here in Hereford with um you know kind of creaky old transformers running out down lanes but if you get this right then you will definitely be massively reducing the carbon intensity of your heating, which in, in almost all homes represents the, the by far the largest energy consumer. Um, and you'll have better comforts uh, and you will be able to reduce your running costs. So if I can turn this the right way this time, it's stuck again. Okay, so yeah, as, as Jackie mentioned, I work with the, closely with the ACB, the Association of Environmentally Conscious Builders, and we, we have always been saying fabric first, and, and in this last 
year we've been looking deeply into that with, with respect to heat pumps and as a result we're developing a new standard we already had a retrofit standard uh, which we're now calling level two but we're developing a level one retrofit standard specifically for heat pumps and the, the purpose of it is is to have a standard that can be self-certified by the um by the designer it doesn't have to go off to somebody else to be certified but it's it's a way of ensuring that a heat pump is being installed um on a house in an appropriate way so that we can have some guarantee that the seasonal performance factors will be high enough that the occupant will not be paying any more for their bills and that the carbon will definitely be being reduced um, and what we did was look at some kind of three types of typical dwellings both solid and cavity walled we assume that they have double glazing in them we assume that the loft will be done up to quite a high level more than more than perhaps the bos grant would require so up to usually 400 millimeters of loft insulation because it's relatively cheap and relatively easy to do that the cavities have definitely been filled uh, and that the air tightness improved is improved um, and that in conjunction with that a ventilation an appropriate ventilation system is put in that's not really to do with energy that's because we care about the air quality in people's homes and as we make them more airtight that becomes more uh, important you'll have all have seen tragic news recently of of um of child suffering and, and dying from mold in rochdale um, and we you know we absolutely must be trying to avoid that uh the standard requires that you have the right amount of radiator output in order to to say that the seasonal performance factor would be of about 3.5 so 350 percent efficient as i say it's 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 set up so that it, it, it should cost no more to heat your home than it did before the fossil fuels and in many cases it will be less but this is absolutely not a, not a, not meant to be an end game it's not meant to be put a heat pump in and then and then forget about it and sit back on your laurels because in many cases your heating costs won't be much cheaper um so it's meant to be a pathway to level two to a, a much deeper retrofit and it should be that the sizing of the heat pump on on this basis will make it possible for for those works to be done later but it's not for everyone and we're still trying to bottom this out i think what we're kind of realizing about the level one retrofit standard is it's absolutely a great thing to be doing but what it's going to weed out is those places where um, it's probably better to go to a deep retrofit first um let's see where i'm going next with this yeah one of the interesting things that came up was that it, it we realized after we'd done those measures it became very sensitive to air tightness um and our retrofit standards have previously had very low levels of air tightness in them the passive house benefit standard has a very low level and the retrofit the acb retrofit standard also has a very low level of air tightness in it as a target um, but what we found doing social housing air tests for social housing retrofits is that where deep retrofit is not being done it's very hard to reach of in fact impossible to reach a very low level of air tightness so we had to pick a level of air tightness that seemed achievable um, but is actually still only kind of modest um, um yeah um and there's yeah, something else to think about that those ventilation systems um yeah one thing that we've realized is that where extract ventilation is used air tightness becomes more important because of trying to get air tightness uh, trying to get ventilation across the whole house if you've got lots of holes then your ventilation system is just going to pull through local holes rather than across the whole house as we'd like to Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about energy modelling, but I'm not going to go into too deep and I'm aware that this I've been warned this scare, slide is a little bit scary. <clears throat> so we use energy modelling to, to predict how much energy is needed to heat a house across a year, um, but also how much power of heat is needed to put into a house to keep it a warm temperature in the coldest times. Uh, in the UK for the regs, we use the standard assessment pre procedure, SAP, which is done on internal dimensions. For passive house, we use the PHPP, which is done on external. Uh, but for heating engineers, you use room by room calculations and the MCS have their own calculations for heat pumps, which must be complied with for installers. And we're all having a little bit of a head tennis exercise, trying to get these three to kind of match up with each other so that 
advice that is given from one place will end up with being um, end up with an MCS installer being able to size appropriately according to what we think. But what, what MCS calcs don't give you is overall energy and carbon and, and overheating outputs, which we get from um, the planning house pack, package, passive house planning package and the standard assessment procedure. We use PHPP for the AECB, those AECB standards, and it's, a, it's an excellent modeling tool, really useful for um, helping to understand uh, where your heat is being lost in your house. And that graphic there up in the top right hand side is one that we use at People Powered Retrofit in Manchester. And that's the kind of thing that you can get out of, a, out of an energy model. It shows you where all your heat losses are. So the arrows represent the amount of heat going through all the elements, the walls, the windows, the ventilation, the floors, uh, the leaks, uh, the roof, the thermal bridges, etc. How am I doing for time? You're fine. Yeah, doing fine. So, yeah, I'm, I'm nearly at the end here, so we're going to have plenty of time for questions. Um, so there's just a few things that I wanted to sort of go over. Um, it really comes down to what is the right timing for converting to a heat pump. Um, in terms of carbon, I think what we've understood is it's always the right time. Um, However, in terms of running costs, it, it might not make so much sense. So whether it's the right time for you uh, really boils down to what kind of type, what kind of house you've got. And what it's starting to look like is if you're in a cavity wall house that's not ridiculously huge or a, a very strange shape uh, and the cavities have been filled and you've got double glazing and you've put loft insulation in, you're almost certainly ripe for having a heat pump in right now. And if you're in a cavity wall house and the cavities haven't been filled and it's appropriate to fill them, then fill them and you can have a heat pump right now. Um, if you're in a solid walled house, if it's a mid terrace, then there's every likelihood that you'll be able to get yourself on a heat pump. Um, all other things being considered, you know, that it's not gonna be a planning consideration or, um, or annoy your neighbors in some way. <coughs> Uh, but if you're in a solid walled house that is semi or detached or a particularly bad form shape, then there you probably need to have a bit of an in-depth look at well, what makes the most sense in terms of sequencing it. Whether or not you're going to need to do some deeper interventions, address some of your walls um, with, with insulation uh, before you have a heat pump or in conjunction with having your heat pump put in as part of a plan. As part of a phased approach, you, you know, you may need to do wall insulation now. Um, but I, I can stress that I think there will be, and, and the ACB models showed that there were solid walled semis that were working quite well without having to have a lot of radiators put in. So it is very much a case by case, and you need to be able to gather the information to find out what's right for you in your case. We do want to we do want to stress that it's important that you have a whole house plan. So whatever you're doing now, even if it is just putting a, a heat pump in, and this is very much part of the level one, um, in order to be eligible and certified for ACB's level one standard, you have to show a plan for going much deeper with a retrofit in the future. In fact, to go into level two, you have to show what it would be, what it would mean, what it would look like demonstrate that you can get to level two. It's not to say that everybody's gonna do that or that you will do that during the tenure of your occupation of the dwelling, but the plan should be there to make that happen. And that any works that are done now, don't hinder those later works being done. And then the other thing to think about is with any works that you're having done now, do think about the upfront carbon of the materials that you're using. Um, using natural materials, using wood fibers, Hemp's, corks, those kind of things have much, much lower carbon intensity, carbon intensity to them. They're, and although they, they used to be a big difference in price, that has started to change. The, the petrochemical insulins have, have started to come, go up in price um, as the oil price has gone up. Uh, yeah, and then the other thing to say, and I know this is hard and, and the question always comes is who should I get to do the installation? Um, and I think, you know, we are generally looking at Hereford Green Network, I think, and probably Future Ready Homes 
and, and other organizations were generally trying to skill up heat pump installers and weed out um, the installers to find those. But generally heat pump installers with experience, and I was at a kind of um, heat pump installer networking thing in, in Manchester last week. Uh, interestingly, those that came along, well, they were all the kind of guys that we, we didn't need to be preaching to. They already kind of had it. They've been putting heat pumps in for for 10 years and they kind of they understand all those important things to be thinking about. But it is a gold rush because of the, the, the boiler upgrade screen we are in. We are in a gold rush at the moment. And as we saw with the RHI and with the with the fit for solar panels, um, there is a lot of kind of opportunism going on. Uh, there are definitely installers out there now that aren't overcharging, but equally there seem to be quite a few who are effectively taking a chunk of that grant by 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 charging for the for the install and um, having a decent markup on that because they know that you're getting the five thousand pounds towards it. Uh, I think that's all I've got. Well, that's absolutely terrific. Thank you, Chavez. Um, I can see there's already quite a lot of questions, which Tony will now be fielding and uh, and dealing with. But it's so interesting. Um, a few of the points you just made at the end there, um, the whole calculation about when a heat pump makes sense has changed, hasn't it, radically? Seven or eight years ago here, um, where I live, we looked at it and thought, no, it's going to be much more in carbon intensive than the solution we went for. Doing it today, it would probably be a different decision. Um, and the other point about the kind of policy, I call it traffic lights policy, stop, go, stop, go. Um, it doesn't help us build out a long-term um, kind of su supply chain and Online. Anyway, that was terrific. I can see lots of um, questions coming in. Tony, are you ready to take over with the Q and A? And I think Jeffes, if you stop sharing, that would be terrific. Okay, where to start? Um, thanks, everyone, for being here and for. Um, Useful and interesting, varied questions. Um, Gervais, can we just start with a, can we go back to sort of the beginning, the, a couple of technical questions about heat pumps. I know you're not a heat pump engineer, but you know a lot more about them than we do. Um, so there've been a couple of questions about um, what do you mean by a cylinder? Um, clearly, as I indicated, that means a hot water cylinder, as in an airing cupboard. Um, but when do you need an expansion tank as well as a hot water cylinder. Can you help us with that? And also there's a question, sort of connected question about um, not just air to water heat pump systems, but air to air, if you have an opinion on those. Okay. Yeah, so a cylinder, you're absolutely right. That is a hot water cylinder. And I was just sort of flagging it up because most people are currently uh, on a combi boiler, which provides instantaneous hot water. Yeah. And Crucially, is sized for that as well. It's not sized for the heating, it's sized for the hot water. So all our combi boilers are very, very big for the amount of heat that we need. Um, so yeah, we've got to now, a lot of homes that had a cylinder taken out have got to be, um, got to find the space for that cylinder again. Uh, an expansion vessel, uh, yeah, I'm not an expert on this, but expansion vessels are basically sized for the amount of volume of water. Um, so they, yeah, it, it might be that you need an, uh, uh, an expansion vessel for your hot water cylinder that goes with your hot water cylinder. But it, it, if it's not a huge hot water cylinder, it shouldn't be too big. You should have some kind of expansion vessel on your system already if you've got a boiler somewhere. Um, and then what was the last question? Oh, yeah. Um, it was about the, um, I mean, we have mentioned this on, on, in previous webinars, actually, is the use of uh, air source heat pump to... Um, provide air to air heating yeah. rather than air to water. I believe one of the advantages is that you, if you can do air to air is that it can be reversed and you can use it for cooling um, in the summer. Yeah, um, I think you can actually do that. You can do that with air to water as well. It's, there's, there's, there's no there's no reason okay. to couldn't do that. Um, yeah, the, so the I think the thing with air to air is that we're sort of starting to work out and I'm looking at this for a, for a small, a sort of small outbuilding that I have at my place um it's it's how you're going to get that air 
moved around uh, a house yeah. how you can, you know so in in a in a space that's much bigger than a kind of modest flat you can see that you're going to need to be able to get the that warm air everywhere into the dwelling and so you might need multiple units the other thing about them is that they're inherently a bit noisy you've kind of got a fan going on in the background those of us who've lived with air conditioning it's basically a similar sort of similar thing so um yeah those are the two things although i've just seen recently seen some nice uh through the wall um units some italian through the wall units which i think will work well in um in small dwellings or in a place where you can have more than one um in a house uh in conjunction with yeah so i've, I've been thinking about it in uh in sort of in a sort of small you can imagine a kind of small flat and because i like to think about places being very airtight and having mvhr in them that means that you have uh a, the ventilation is pull is supplying air in one place and then taking it into another and for a lot of for a lot of places that means they're going into something like the bedroom uh and then it's being drawn to the bathroom the air that's the airflow is doing that but you wouldn't want your air to air to air heater in your bedroom because it would just be noisy so you're kind of you've got a kind of contraflow thing going on you can't you're getting the airflow going the wrong way for getting the heat about and that's quite often a, an issue with um heating via air is that there's a mismatch between the amount of air needed for heating and the amount of air needed for ventilation right okay thank you um more general uh, question um again on still on the cylinder um how much space internally is required for it um i would venture an answer that um well that depends on how much hot water you want um but um I, if you think about the size of a typical hot water cylinder and a, a, a um a um cupboard what am i talking about yeah. um an airing cupboard um that would be a good guide um and the other question is are new heat pumps less noisy externally than they used to be and i can say the answer to that is absolutely yes because i had one about 10 years ago and it made a terrible racket and they're a lot quieter now they've all got decibel ratings and they tend to sit on rubber feet uh, which helps a lot um so i'm trying to help you there Gervais. so i hope i haven't got any of that wrong no um, I, think any... I think i'd largely agree with that yeah i mean I, just to touch on the cylinder thing as well like in my retrofit assessment work a lot of what i'm dealing with uh, is not just energy performance but also uh, moisture performance and a lot of the problem that we find in people's homes is that they're not adequately ventilated it was in a home last week which was chronically moldy uh, family of four that were yeah it's, they seemed sort of uh, a bit stuck they couldn't really they didn't really understand why it was but it was clear really what was happening they were drying their clothes on the radiators and they didn't have any trickle vents in their windows and they didn't have any ventilation system at all and there were places were cold in their home and so they were just getting condensation and mold on their on their walls and on their ceilings so what we try and do in retrofit is to try and work into people's homes a dedicated drying space um and it's not always possible it's not always easy not everybody has a utility room but if you can find a space for drying dedicated and it can get and it can, you can get a dedicated ventilator to that then the scavenged heat from a cylinder because they are they do lose heat by nature um, is an ideal place to add a little bit of warmth so you've got a little bit of warmth you've got something like nearby that's drawing the air out and now you've got somewhere to dry and it's you know it's cheaper than running a rumble dryer obviously um, and it's not creating a massive moisture load into the rest of the house as far as how big are cylinders um i think probably uh bigger than a bigger than a couple of feet you know kind of sort of 80 centimeters by 80 centimeters square and up to kind of a meter and a half tall i suppose for a kind of average for family home smaller for a for, for, for a smaller dwelling and, and a bit bigger for a larger dwelling. Can I chip in with a question there, which is how many litres typically? 300, 600? Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, 100, I think sort of 170 is like is ample for a four bedroom property. 170, 200, something like that. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, I'm going to carry on then. Thank you for that. Um, 
couple of suggestions. Jackie, jump in if um, if I'm saying something inappropriate. Um, we've had an, a request for a list of acronyms with definitions, which I think is an excellent idea. I'm sure we can provide that. Also, a copy of Gervais's presentation. Can that be provided? Obviously, this vid the video of this um, presentation will be available anyway. So um, yes, I'm sure that's absolutely fine. Um, one more on the air to air quickly. Um, I've got a friend with a gas powered hot air system. Um, is there a heat pump solution for these kind of systems? I think that's exactly what Gervais was um, mentioning that if the, the ducting is already there through the property to, to deliver the hot air, then that would be ideal. Uh, yeah? Yes, uh, mm, probably not. No. And okay. um, the reason for that is that thing about high, low temperature. So yeah, I mean, I think there is an upper limit on how warm you want to warm air. And I think people say 52 degrees is the upper limit to what you want to warm air to, because after that, it starts to smell a bit burnt. Um, but in order to get air to 52 degrees, you can see that the the whatever you need to heat it will have to be hotter than that. And then you're into kind of the too high temperatures in order to in order to um, to get the, the heat to that temperature. So the ducts basically probably won't be sized correctly for a heat pump um yeah okay I, th I think i think probably not right okay uh let's get squarely back to the fabric first question um so james uh smith was asking um surely fabric first is still important we still need to reduce our demand in general um heat demand energy demand um and therefore improve you know fabric first is still important and a more specific question from Anne um, working on a solid wall detached house um, at the moment which is grade two listed the walls are 450 mil thick and difficult to insulate are these sap rates uh, thick stone walls is probably less thermally efficient than they actually are so we're thinking of heat pumps plus underfloor heating on the ground floor and existing radiators any thoughts on that okay so on the fabric first absolutely uh well what we're saying is for carbon in almost all cases the the quickest cheapest both in terms of money and in terms of carbon intervention that you can make is a heat pump but obviously if you can reduce your demand as well, that will further reduce both the running costs and the carbon. But be aware that there is a carbon cost associated with doing the fabric first. So, yeah, this is this is this totalist thing. I mean, it, it took me months. Like I'm like people were talking about this maybe eighteen months ago. People who I you know, had a lot of respect for, we're starting to say this thing about heat pumps. And I'll be honest, I completely blanked it for about four months because it just made no sense to me at all. And several of other us have done it. It took quite a lot of um, nudging and poking from, from like various quarters before we started looking at this more seriously. But um, because it, it, it does run counter and I was talking, I was trained at CAT um, in, in, in West Wales. And I was talking to one of their students last week about her, her, um, uh, thesis because she wants to do something on retrofit and I was telling her about this and she said but this goes you know against everything that we've just been taught and I said yes I know I'm sorry <laughs> but you know this this is where we're at this is what we've realized is that it absolutely makes sense for us to be doing heat pump conversions at a high pace probably at a higher pace than it does to be doing deep interventions but we should not lose sight of the fact that in order to reduce people's running costs when running costs are spiraling out of control and the overall demand reduction so that we can have a grid that can cope and so that we're generally using um, less energy is absolutely true it's just that that fabric first it's just the first bit that we're, we're changing we're not saying don't do fabric we're just saying get a heat pump on um yeah and by the way you know we're not saying put pv panels on that's 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 still the fabric first is still applies when it when it comes to heat, uh, when it comes to uh, to photovoltaic panels. Can I okay, chip in, wants can to I chip to. in as well? Sorry, always chipping in here, um, which is to say that quite often as you know, what we're focusing on here is getting ready for a heat pump. But there are other drivers, aren't there, towards doing um, 
retrofit, fabric first retrofit, um, which are to do with comfort levels and to do with maintaining the building. So I think it's probably wise to keep those in the viewfinder as, as well. And I imagine that's um, that's the approach you would normally take to these. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, you know that's that's why in that ACB level one standard, um, the you know we we looked at kind of condensation levels, but that's why it's it's you know it's required that you have a ventilation system put in because it's no it's no good improving the places and and having them un, you know improving the air tightness and having them unventilated. We absolutely need to absolutely need to have healthy buildings, and we want people to be comfortable in times when energy is expensive. So it, it is a bit of a balancing act. And an energy model will tell you exactly how much of a balancing act it is. It will tell you, it will predict for you how much it's going to cost you to run if you only put a heat pump in now. And then you can make your own judgment on whether you want to be putting a heat pump and more measures in at the same time. Can I pop in a question too, which is if somebody's got a house that's cold, that is not currently being um, heated sufficiently by their current system, um, then chances are I, that a heat pump's not going to fix that, right? Uh, their current heating system doesn't work. Is that what you're saying? Or doesn't deliver the a desired level of comfort? Um, well, there's lots of reasons why that might be true. Um, it might just be that they don't have enough radiators. Or that the system's not been flushed, so the you know there could be a lot of reasons for that. Mm. You you might be right, you might be right, that, but it just it just points to the fact that the system overall is not functioning properly in some way. Yeah. Sorry, there was another question there, Tony. So there was a listed solid walled. Sorry, yes, it's quite specific. Yeah, um, listed solid wall house walls are four hundred and fifty mil thick and difficult to insulate. Um, RD SAP rates the thick stone walls as probably less thermally efficient than they actually are. So we're thinking of a heat pump plus underfloor heating, ground floor and existing radiators. Just what are your thoughts on that? Um, um, well, without seeing the specifics, um, I, I'd be sort of tentative to say much. But what I would say is, yes, it is true that we have long assumed new values of thick stone walls to be somewhat higher than it turns out that they are. However, um, that we're only talking 10, 20 percent. They're still, you know, they're still not nothing like the performance of, for example, a even, a, you know, pretty old and badly filled cavity wall. Um, and, yeah, this just sort of goes back to the the thing of uh, you, you can get a heat pump. And, I, you know, I'm aware I've been, been involved in a listed farmhouse four-story listed farmhouse which had, you know they were they were putting a ground source heat pump on but it was you know 24 28 kilowatt ground source heat pump it was going to be a massive thing um uh existing radiators very unlikely to be able to cope with a efficiently with a heat pump so if i, I would expect you to be looking at increasing the radiator output unless by some chance you've got massively oversized radiators um and when you say hard to insulate solid walls it is hard but there are there are solutions there are there are things that you can do there are things that even conservation officers will accept um good solutions and you know even doing a little bit to a wall will make a big difference so incidents mm -hmm. like diethanite um and lime wood fiber will protect the heritage um uh, traditional nature of the of the construction but provide um an extra level of thermal performance mm. so yeah i'd be yeah I, I think this sort of thing is going on um and i do understand the kind of desire to go to it and this is one of the reasons is that putting a heat pump in is a lot easier than doing a lot of wall insulation mm. but yeah with the costs the way they are at the moment mm. uh, i think you could you could end up looking uh, uh, very expensive bills but uh, this is a question i've i've thought about myself actually where, where the walls are particularly difficult to insulate if instead you know you dig up the floor which clearly some people wouldn't want to do either if you if you're digging up the floor and putting in a decent amount of insulation and then you have an under underfloor you know heating system um connected to your heat pump is that a good solution or is that just asking for the heat to sort of leak out the walls 
if that's sorry if that's a crude question no i mean i think you've nailed it there yeah the, in, in almost all models the floor is the is the least loss and you can it's, it's quite obvious to think why the the loss for a floor is around the perimeter the bit in the middle of the building is usually not close to if not at the temperature of the rest of the house so that's why we often end up into well there's two reasons why we often end up insulating floors last it's one is because it's like the thing that you're standing on so it's actually probably the hardest thing to do harder than than doing the walls really usually but secondly it's because actually in terms of performance gain it's it's the least um right. the least suitable measure what it does give you is increased comfort and if you are looking to put underfloor heating down then it's absolutely imperative that you get it insulated and therefore doing the floor is a kind of bit of a no-brainer um, but as a measure on its own it's unlikely in a, what i assume to be a detached it might not be but what i assume to be a detached solid walled property um, doing the floor and converting to underfloor heating i'm sure it'll be possible i just think you'll find it's very expensive to run okay um Right, there's an alternative question here about, I mean, the assumption we've been making um, is replacing uh, a, a gas boiler with a source heat pump. Uh, fair enough, that's a reasonable observation because we have pretty much. Um, this person has um, wood-fired boiler stove running their central heating system. So have you got a view on replacing that? I suppose that's the difficult question of how do you feel about biomass as a, as a fuel? Um, we used to think of it as, as a sustainable option 10, 15 years ago and, and less so now, I think. But um, what's your view on that, Gervais? Yeah, no, that's it, absolutely. And I hold my hands up here. I was involved in um, pushing very hard to get two very large biomass boilers put into a meditation centre that I, I run the building services for just down the road from me here in 2014. And I think if I'd done it two years later, I wouldn't have done it. I'm not sure what I would have done because we were on oil there um it's a tricky one if you're getting your wood or if you're getting wood logs sourced locally and you're you know you're absolutely sure that it's being regrown uh there's maybe a case for it um if you're getting pellets shipped in from wherever um yeah the problem is we just can't grow, grow trees fast enough Yep. we're burning it and we're putting it into the air it's filthy stuff as well it's it, you know the particulates from it are much worse than they are from gas boilers for example and even oil boilers um so yeah i yeah it, it it isn't sustainable for us to operate on um uh on on wood hmm. uh, and and get our carbon um emissions down fast yep. enough Okay, um, right, a practical question about servicing. I feel a heat pump has more moving parts than a boiler system. This means more service calls and more expensive for the owner in the long run. I believe, I've heard, I think the opposite and certainly the longevity that heat pump will last, will outlast a, a gas boiler, um, which helps the cost over the long term uh, come down. But um, do you know about servicing, Gervais? Do they need a lot of servicing? No, I don't think. I think you're right, Tony. Um, like, I think I think it's a fallacy to think that there are a lot of moving parts in a boiler. Um, yeah, they're pretty complicated. Thing. They've got them pretty well nailed now, combi boilers. But um, yeah, I, I think both of them. You'd want to. They're your heat source, and you'd want them serviced regularly. But um, yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't think it's an issue. We've kind of modelled for heat pumps being replaced every 17 years, and they say typically 12 years for a gas boiler. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, comment from James again. Uh, there's a carbon cost for nuclear power stations too. You're um, very right about that. Having lived in Somerset close to Hinkley, there's eye-watering amounts of concrete going into that, but let's not go there. Um, right. Uh, very apt question for everybody. Typically, what proportion of the cost is the government's uh, 5,000 pounds, that's from the boiler upgrade scheme. So just to be clear, we've been talking about air source heat pumps here, which are much more uh, sort of accessible to most people. The boiler upgrade scheme gives a contribution of 5,000 pounds for air source. It would be 6,000 pounds towards ground source. Um, what sort of cost are we looking at, Gervais? I think typically well, we've been looking at what sort of 15 yeah. or so? Yeah, so Octopus are now offering 
uh, £2,000 for an installation. And they will get the £5,000. So they're saying they're going to do installations for £7,000. I've seen, I mean, that's obviously Octopus and they're working massively at scale. They've got Dakin, they've built, got Dakin to build a factory to building heat pumps. Um, they, you know, they're, they're working at such scale. So they've got that advantage. They're, you know, they're, they're massively upskilled to get it done. But then no, I've heard... Just jump in. Are those available now or is that a future plan? No, no, that's been, yeah, I had a survey done several months ago now. Um, they wouldn't give me one, but that's because I live in a weird house. Um, they couldn't make it fit. They, you know, they're doing bog standard houses. They're trying to pick off the stuff that's easy to do, obviously, because they're trying to they're trying to skill up their installers. They're trying to skill up their assessors. So they're just picking off the you know the mass really. They're picking the middle of the the middle of the curve of of normality, which which makes sense. Let's do that. Let's do the easy stuff first. Let's get it done. Um, but then I've also heard about. I heard of an installer in Manchester who was only charging seven and a half thousand for the whole thing and he was taking five thousand. So the, the cost was only two and a half thousand pounds to the client. But I think those are quite extreme cases. We're working on the on the basis of kind of 10 to 12. Um, it really depends on what other works you need doing. Yeah. Like a five kilowatt heat pump is three and a half grand. That's how much they cost. You know, best will in the world, it's not going to take more than a couple of days to put it in. And, and even the most expensive plumbers, you know, that's that's not going to be more than a thousand pounds for two guys doing that in. Um, so, you know, theoretically, it shouldn't be that much. Obviously, they've got to cover a lot more overheads, but but you know, you can you can see that there's there's the scope for adding a bit on. They've got the liability. They've got to do all the paperwork for the for the MCS and the BOS scheme. Um, but then there is the question of New Cylinder and any upgrades to radiators and any upgrades to the existing system flushing out the system if it might be needed so there's various add-ons there's some places they'll walk up to it's already got a cylinder it's already got enough radiators and it's really just a question of banging the heat pump on and you know hopefully a very simple control strategy but there will be other places where you know more works need to be done okay um, thank you for that. I'm um, sorry, I'm going to try and focus on the more general questions um, rather than the specifics. So forgive me if I don't aren't read out your specific question. I think we've had enough uh, discussion of air to air um, for now. It's a bit of a niche subject. Um, I've been told that in my cold, damp Welsh winter environment with lots of trees around the house, I have been told that the heat pump will have often have moisture condensating on it and ice overrun and run in defrost mode and be very inefficient and expensive to run? Question mark. Defrost cycle. Um, yes, we haven't touched on that. It's a, yeah. Um, I, I, I don't think I'm really qualified to talk about that. Um, that is a sizing issue. So um, yeah, having enough volume to work at, yeah, I, I don't know. It'd be really down to who's told you that and whether an installer of some experience is, is you know, is giving you that advice or whether it's come from somebody else. Hmm. But I can see that possibly, you know, potentially being an issue. I suppose one, I don't wish to be stupid, but one answer to that is, is put it in the warmest possible place. I mean, I know people who've, um, for instance, because of the noise, they've put their, their heat pump down the garden and um because it's got no protection whatsoever there it, it has to work harder to to defrost than had it been put by the by the house where there's some shelter um and they've also suffered all the losses from having the pipes yeah run that distance as well yes indeed um we have a range and it is hard to keep the house warm could you please give me some advice well there's a nice general question you have a range and it's hard to keep your house warm like you only have a range sounds like it um and it's what oil fired or wood fired or something yeah, yeah. i mean hello hello yes uh, just my question uh, yes we have you only have a range and the, the radiators also right the range revenge provides the heat to the radiators yes yeah and it's powered by oil or oil yeah yeah they're um they need to go, I'm afraid. Oh my God, it's getting really expensive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're, very, the they're, very, very to run. they're very, very inefficient. 
they're very very hard to control so you you know you're getting heat out of them all the time when you don't need it um yeah it, we're, we're gonna have to get away from from range heating it's it, it it belonged to an era um where we had different comfort needs it turns out where people were were happier in uh, in lower comfort and where energy costs were much 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 lower well, is this your advice as well that's my feeling on them yeah like I, I have them yeah I come across them quite a lot and yeah I mean I, my, my, my parents have one and they have storage heaters in the rest of the house and they have they cook they cook on it you know they use it for their cooking they really do but they're you know they've got storage heaters they're paying three or four thousand pounds a year for electricity for their storage heaters they're paying two two and a half thousand pounds for oil for what is essentially just their cooker and does does their hot water it's yeah, it's madness okay so a connected question is um with the massive jump in electricity prices it's keep it it's cheaper to keep oil fired central heating um i'd jump in with a couple of comments about that uh, one is you can decarbonize electricity but you can't decarbonize oil um, and the second is um as we all know the the electricity price has been linked to to gas prices in in this country for quite a long time and i believe the government is legislating to break that link so that um you know electricity prices will possibly um well come down long term and they should do with the um rolling out of more and more um renewables um so Gervais, i think i know what your view might be of oil fired yeah so so the yeah, the, the, to talk talk about the the gas versus electricity. So what we I've been watching the price caps as they've kind of come in over the last when it, once price caps became a uh, a kind of talking point, I was really sort of on them. And what I noticed was the most recent price cap that they put in, which was the October one, which was the government's own rather than off gems, it was the government's own. They'd actually pulled the price of electricity closer to the price of gas. The ratio had dropped. It used to be that the gas to electricity price ratio was over four. Uh, and even got up close to five at some point, some points. So, you know, gas price was three and a half pence. Electricity price was 17 or 18 pence. Um, so the price cap at the moment is 10.4 and 34. So it's now uh, under three and a half, which curiously is um, about the recommended SPF for a heat pump. And that doesn't even allow for the efficiency or inefficiency, as you might see, of, of a gas boiler. What that means is that if you have a if you have a heat pump working well if you just plug it in where your boiler was and you've got enough radiator output it will actually be cheaper to run it than it would be on mains gas last time i checked um heating oil price it was 92p a liter i don't know what it is now um that is marginally cheaper than um than mains gas it's true um but it's still you know within a margin of error um, and, you know, and assuming you don't have a brand new, very effective, efficient um, condensing oil boiler, the likelihood is that you're only getting 80% out of that. And therefore, the cost per kilowatt hour is still more than that three and a half factor for a heat pump. OK. Um, plus, on, plus carbon, as you say. Yeah. Um, on on the cost, um, I mean, you were talking. I was very interested in what you were saying about the the AECB level one and the idea being that um, there's some sort of guarantee that your bills won't be higher if you move from you get rid of your gas your combi boiler and you move to um, an air source heat pump system. Um, I suppose it's fanciful, I suppose, but um, I'd be very interested if there was any notion of actually sort of having a, a genuine guarantee that is backed up financially. Uh, presumably the AECB wouldn't be stepping in to, to offer that. Um, and I don't suppose installers or manufacturers would want to either, but um, it would give the market the confidence that it perhaps needs, um, you know, to for people to take the step um, and, and have a source heat pump installed. Sure. Yeah, no, you're right. I, like, I, like, I actually wanted to make it a criteria, but um, the others of us that were working on it kind of pointed out that they didn't want their professional indemnity affected by this. And when you think about it, it's actually impossible to, to actually measure, really. Um, and 
this this sort of talks to another whole other fear, which I've only recently become aware of. The the carbon co-op that you, the people powered retrofit in Manchester used to be part of are just running a, a Europe wide scheme, a thing on on something called an EPC, which uh, has confused me because I thought an EPC was an energy performance certificate, but it also turns out it's something called an energy performance contract, which is basically this, and it, it's not really uh, it's not really managed managed um, imagined to be a kind of single occupant. Uh, domestic level it's more kind of social housing stuff but it's basically a contract an energy performance contract that's built into a fabric or building delivery contract yeah. um and <laughs> the thinking about it is is that there's actually no way to make it work they're going to do it they're doing an exercise in it but they're not expecting anything to come out of it at the moment because it's so hard to pin down you have to have had like really really good monitoring beforehand and you have to have really, really good monitoring afterwards in order to establish what you're comparing. And what the ACB level one standard is saying is that if you put a heat pump in under the conditions that we're recommending, so with the loft insulation, with the double glazing, with the improved air tightness, even with the ventilation system added in, it should not cost you more than it does with your house as it is at the moment on gas. But you may not end up heating your house the same way. How can we say how who's going yeah. to say what temperature you had it before what temperature you had it afterwards we all know that in any kind of retrofit people will take a little bit in comfort um so it's really hard to pin down yes of course um jackie i can see you've got your hand up I, I was going to move on to your question about where an air source heat pump should be cited if i can um yeah um the question is is it correct that the heat pump needs to be um, one meter from the house in England, but three meters away in Wales. Do you know? Is that correct? Uh, I know. I I'm working on a job in Wales, and it can be on the house. Um, so I, th I think it's it's more, and it, and it's not a meter here. I think you need three hundred mil behind a heat pump wherever you put it. Um, it's one meter or three meters from the boundary with your neighbour. Right. Okay. Thank you. So, sorry, so is that correct? One metre from the boundary in England, but three metres from the boundary in Wales? Um, I'm not sure about the England, but it's true of Wales. I didn't, I wasn't aware of there being a difference, but it's quite possibly true, yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't see, I, yeah, no, I, I, I definitely am aware of people putting, putting heat pumps on their party wall. Um, yeah, down their, down their party walls. On the in their gardens and things in the UK, so I don't in, the, in mm. England. I don't think that is an issue, but I definitely know that that has come up um, with a job in Cardiff. Right. Yes. I I don't think the specific distance is the issue in England. I think it's the 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 actual decibel rating. Um, yeah, and so there is some consideration about appearance as well. I think. Right. Okay. Um, I must say thank you everyone for all your questions. We are running short of time, so if you've got anything you're desperate to ask, please pop it in the chat right now. Um, yeah, I was the... going to ask a question if I could, Tony. Um, sorry about the red herring there with the distance. Um, we just to say, Gervais, um, are you happy to take any more questions about specific cases and specific homes, albeit these are ones that you've not seen, so you know it can't constitute professional advice, um, but that might be something that people could pop in just now. In what form? In this format? Yes, uh, now while we're still uh, while we're still together today. If our question creator thinks that they <laughs> might have a more general, you know, I, I can see there's 41 messages in the chat. I don't know how far you've got through them, Tony, but no, we're, we're pretty much there. Um, okay. Right, I've got a good general question from Alison. Thank you. Um, is the SPF of 3.5 an annual average? What's the figure in the UK winter? I think. Um, Yes, it is an annual, it is an annual SPF average. SPF actually is specifically something that is generated by PHP, P, which is the planning house planning. Uh, sorry, I keep saying that, the passive house. Passive house. Um, so it's great, the, uh, the PHP, P. It, you know, they really doesn't pull any punches at all. It requires you, when you're entering a heat pump, it requires you to enter all the information. In fact, I had it on one of my slides. It, if you can get them to do it, the manufacturers give you uh, the what their COPs, which is the coefficient of performance for a range of external and internal temperatures. Not sorry, not internal. A range of external temperatures and flow temperatures. So that is effectively the difference between 
the temperature of the emitter and the temperature of the source. And different machines perform differently under different circumstances. And there's a standard set. So it starts at like minus 15, then there's a minus seven, a minus two, zero, three, five, 10, 15, 20. And then flow temperatures could be as low as 25, 35, 45, 55. And manufacturers can provide, if you can get them to, they can provide the information for all those different points. You plug that into PHPP and with this heating system that you've got set up in that, it will tell you what the season performance factor is across the year. And it will vary, yes, in, in winter. But actually in summer, it's, it's kind of worse because if you're getting it to do your hot water, typically you're getting your hot water to a, you know 60 degrees. And so the SPF across the summer can be quite bad. It's just that you're not using it very much. Um, but yeah, it's true to say that in spring and autumn, your SPFs are likely to be better because the outside temperature is generally warmer. Okay, um, comment from James, he uses 2.5 just to be cautious. Um, fair enough. Um, question from Andrew, what are the best quality air source heat pumps? I don't think we give recommendations like the BBC um, and the price right where well, we've already discussed the price range. Um, there are a great many air source heat pumps out there on the market, I would say. Um, they're getting better all the time, I think. And indeed, they're getting more efficient. Uh, the heat pumps are better manufactured and the type of refrigerant they use is, is more efficient as well. Um, right, a more specific question. Uh, with my old solid detached, yeah, sorry, solid wall listed building, it's not looking for straightforward. Please could you again point me to where I should, what I should do next, please. EPC survey whole house plan and where to look. Well, I can answer that one, Rich. I would apply to Future Ready Homes without delay. Um, either in Shropshire or Herefordshire or Powys. Um, so I should say, so the March's Energy Agency link, which I put in the chat um, at the outset is for Shropshire. Um, otherwise, as Jackie's just asked, if you're in um, Herefordshire or Powys, you need to go to the 7Y Energy Agency and they are um, handling it. There you go, 7Y for you, Rich. Okay, um, I think we might wrap things up just about there and I'll hand back to Jackie um, as we've run out of questions. That's terrific. Thank you so much, Tony. You've done a great job as ever and thank you, Gervais. So um, it, thank you everyone who's turned up today. Uh, we will be sending you, my colleague Gemma, who will give a wave in a minute, uh, will be uh, sending out information with a link to the recording of the event and um, we'll attempt to take ongoing Q&A through our email address. Oh, could you pop that in the chat as well, please, Gemma? I forgot to do that earlier. Um, so it would be great to think that any of these actions that you're thinking of taking, whether it's a heat pump or any sort of retrofit is part, as Gervais has said, of, of a whole house plan, a long-term strategy so that you know exactly um, that what you're doing fits fits into a plan and um, you've got a roadmap. So those can be offered through um, Future Ready Homes, but all through, also through other um, sources. So 7Y Energy Agency offer various types of um, assessment and whole house plan and um, Gervais's company does them too. Um, other suppliers are available. Great. Um, thank you all very, very much for coming. Thanks in particular to, to Gervais for doing a great presentation there. And uh, we'll be in touch. And uh, thank you all again. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. Thanks all.